Hey everyone, the name is Eric Dorn. What brought on this video is a question from one of you guys, one of my latest patrons, Peter. Peter asked me about the INTJX cognitive functions and a quick search on YouTube made me aware that I've never actually talked about this subject before. Come on guys, why haven't any of you told me to make this video before? Let's talk today about INTJs and their top 4 cognitive functions as according to the MBTI. So, principally the INTJ is said to have introverted intuition, the existential and philosophical thought process as their dominant function, as one of their core processes or core values that becomes one of their key priorities in life. Then, extroverted thinking becomes the secondary or helpful or supportive process the process that is supposed to make the INTJ's life better, the idea in the INTJ's head of what they should do or what would be great to do. And extroverted in thinking, that's the authoritative and pragmatic process. It's that results-oriented approach. If you focus on results, if you can see what matters and what's valuable and what's smart, and if you can speak out and stand up for that, you're going to be happier. Then your life is going to get better. That's that voice in your head, INTJs, okay? If you do this, your life is going to be better. That's extroverted thinking. Then you have introverted feeling, which is more like the childlike, introspective, tertiary relief process in the INTJ. It's the process that says, but it would be so much easier if you just took it easy and just found inner peace and harmony and just knew yourself and just live a life in tune with yourself. Yeah, I should do this because it would make my life so good and I would be so cool and I would be so awesome. But then the introverted feeling is that process that goes like, but it's so much easier, you know, if you just take a step back, you just take a deep breath and just find some inner peace. Finally, the fourth process called the three-year-old or the inferior process, the baby or the rival or the demon even in some uh, versions, uh, extroverted sensing represents that fierce fighter spirit of somebody with strong views, with a realistic approach to life, somebody that knows how things are and what things are and what matters and what does not matter. Extroverted sensing is that voice in your head of uh, nature and of what matters and what's true and what's false and what's right and what's wrong. So... Introverted intuition is like a sage-like and dominant and natural process in the INTJ, you know, whenever an INTJ is in flow, in the zone, they can access like a higher wisdom of introverted and intuition. So what they can draw is from this is like they can draw truths about life and what things are and why we are here and what life is and what the universe is and what matters and what everything is made of. I Introverted intuition is that like inner truth about things and what things are, what people think and what's happening in life and what the world is coming to and what kind of world we are living in. So introverted intuition is always filling you with that base truth, you know, okay, it's teaching you about life. It's that constant, okay, this is why I'm here. This is what I'm doing. This is what brought me here. This is what matters. This is who I am. This is, you know, that process that reminds you of... Uh, where we are, it gives you some base, uh, it gives you a base orientation of life, you know, it teaches you what's up and what's down and who you are and where you are and where you're from and all those things. It's basically like a superpower. It's basically like something that just comes to you naturally as an ITJ. You don't have to ask for it, you don't have to fight for it, you don't have to push yourself to do it, you don't have to... Uh, force it out or something it's there you know it. it's there it's always there it's a flow flow process the only time when you're completely blocked from this process is when you are using the three-year-old function when you're putting on the bricks you know what you have to realize is you know life can be seen in two ways it can be that pure state of mind you know sometimes I like to visualize say myself as if I'm in space looking down at the world an introverted intuition can feel like that for an INTJ, uh, INFJ as well as an INTJ life can feel like you're a mind you're a space and life and world and everything that matters in life and what's right and wrong and what we should do and what things are and what things are not that's happening down there on earth you know 
So it can feel like you're looking down on Earth from outer space. And what you can say is often a lot of people will talk to an INTJ or an INFJ with, you know, a lot of fierce passion, you know. This should not happen. This is wrong. This is not right. We should change this. We should fix that. We should do this differently. The society should change. This is, uh, you know, a lot of people will talk to an INTJ or an INFJ with this, you know, frenzied tone of voice. You know, when you have a strong feeling about something or when you have a strong idea or something or when you strongly see the world in a certain way you know that should be there and that should be there and that's extroverted sensing you know a lot of people feel INTJs and INFJs coming from introverted intuition come from a place of calm unnatural calm how can they be so calm how can they be so at peace with this how can they be so okay with this how can they accept this? How can they deal with the fact that there is death in the world and that there is hardship and difficulties and struggles? So a lot of people will raise their voice or push or come at the INTJ or INFJ with very strong viewpoints. Try to force the INTJ or INFJ into a position where they also become frenzied, also get angry, also get upset, also try to speak out and make the world better, you know. They are trying to rally you to action. Extorted sensing is trying to get you to care about the external world of sensory facts and of what's happening around you. If they're trying to awake you, look, this is happening, look, there is a world here. <laughs> and But the INTJ or the INFJ can sometimes respond with the serious case of detachment. Uh-huh. Oh yeah, oh that's nice. Or, mm-hmm. Mm, okay, I see. <laughs> or or they would come at you with uh, some existential reasonings or philosophical truths. That's life. That's how things are. That's how the world works, you know. The INTJ or the INFJ's primary pursuit is just to understand why things are the way they are. Not to get caught up in or to get overwhelmed by the facts that the world or life is in a certain way. But to simply come from that perspective of Zen and of uh, introspection and of awareness about life and about death and about everything. Not to say INTJs or INFJs cannot care about the world or that they don't want to change some aspects of it or that they don't want to make things differently. But it's that the world is secondary preference to them and the world of the mind which is also a world of how you want the world to be and of how you see things and of how you understand things intuitively comes above it. So detachment is an important aspect of introverted intuition. Extroverted sensing comes up as a kind of frenzying state, you know, that can take you over in the moment. You can become restless. You can, in the moment, you can start getting overwhelmed by everything that's happening around you. All the noises, all the sensations, everything that's happening. Often it can be that it's difficult to deal with the physical world of things and of events and of actions and of experiences. You're constantly hammered by people, you're constantly asked for attention, you're asked to listen, you're asked to observe, you're asked to pay attention, and you're asked to deal with the world and to respond to the world around you, to have an opinion on everything that's going on, to be aware of everything that's happening in your environment and to engage with and to talk with and to interact with the world, of the physical world of this these five senses. But often it's that you don't want to. I don't want to. Can I, can I not stay at home instead? Can I not sit back and observe from a distance? Or maybe later. I, I'll, I'll look at this later. You know, I, I can't right now, but maybe tomorrow. You know, Sometimes you can do that. It's a bit douchey, but you can do that. You can say that. And... Uh, there is also a tendency to feel like you're forced to do it. And when you're forced to do it, you also come at it with an extra state of frenzy. It's like, yeah, okay, fine. It's that you're getting upset by the things that happen around you and that people come asking you a question or they come asking you for help. And you're like, what now? Okay. <laughs> they can see like the frustration flaring up in your eyes, the anger flaring up in your eyes when you're like forced to put... Uh, put out the tension or to deal with something that's happening that you would rather not have to think about or deal with. 
So, I want to talk about extroverted thinking in the framework of this and the introverted feeling. Often you could say the introverted feeling is like an escapist process, you know, it's uh, that it gives you relief, it gives you calm, it gives you peace, so it's very tempting, it's a temptation. So, it's a temptation not to care and it's a temptation to not have to deal with shit. You know, shit is happening, there are issues in the world, there are problems that need to be dealt with, there are things you should do that would make things better, but there is a temptation not to do shit. There is a temptation to just, you know, escape into relief in introverted feeling. And what you can hap- what can happen is, uh, yeah, there is a tendency to be drawn towards escapist fiction and towards easy subjects and of a world where people are not annoying and where you don't have to do stuff and where you don't have to deal with things that are happening around you. And there's a tendency to like degrade uh, from you know that uh, higher wisdom of extroverted thinking, because you know extroverted thinking that's like. Yeah, you know it's the right thing to do. You know that, yeah, if I just used the extroverted thinking more, if I pushed myself more, if I stood up and I uh, became more authoritative and pushy and fought a little harder, my life would be better. You know, that's extroverted thinking. If I did this, my life would be better. Yeah, I know I should because it's very effective and it would make things, uh, make my dreams come true. You know, you have, often as an INTJ, you have like, introverted intuition which reminds you of uh, you know how you ideally see the world from the perspective of intuition and you have introverted thinking that reminds you of what is right and wrong and what's accurate and what's inaccurate what's true and what's false and you have thinking and judging that says what you should how you should do something and how you should put it to practice it's an idea of a plan or a strategy you have intuition and judging that gives you like a vision of how things could be. It shows you like where you could go and how to get there. But now, extra thinking, that's the process that gets you to actually execute and to enact this vision. Without it, without this higher calling towards doing something, you would remain in a passive apathy of just being happy with how things are. You would be like... Uh, I have a vision and I have a plan, but I'm not. I don't need to do it. I don't need to do anything at all. I can just have my sen and know this plan and be happy with that because I'm just an introvert. I'm just this inner world. I'm just this inner idea. But you're not this inner world either. You're not alone. This thing. You also derive meaning and value from extroverted thinking and from extroverted intuition and from a lot of other processes. A lot of other processes will give you similar amount of energy or a higher amount of energy and higher amount of motivation than what you would find in alone introverted intuition and introverted thinking. So listening to this process is very important. The problem is that this process is so difficult to engage in. A lot of people say, yeah, build your extroverted thinking. But what they forget to tell you is it's actually kind of hard. It's kind of difficult. You have to push yourself. You have to challenge yourself. You have to be uh, authoritative. You have to be effective. You have to, uh, you know, spot opportunities. You have to see different possibilities. You have to go out there in life. You have to take risks. You have to try new things. You have to open yourself up to possibilities. You have to have dreams, you know. You have to. It's, uh, It's that... You have to, and that's an, uh, that already makes it feel like you're climbing up a hill. You know, whenever you're engaging in an auxiliary process, it's like you're climbing up a hill or running up a hill. You're like, oh, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, you know. So that's the problem with this process. It takes work, it takes effort, and it's scary. You know, as you do, you also notice that behind you, a wedge, a, uh, uh, an abyss is opening up before you. And now I'm getting a bit dramatic. What I'm just trying to tell you is that there is that risk of falling and falling back into your old habits and of losing everything you worked at and failing and of not achieving anything and of doing all this work for nothing. The higher you go and the more motivated you get and the more energetic and excited you get about something, the more afraid you become of failure, of not being able to make it happen, of not being able to see it through. And it's also like that fear of losing your progress, you know, getting fa- far in something without being able to save your progress, without being able to um, gain any value from it or any merit from it. We all fear, you know, we fear being alive as much as we fear dying. You know, we 
fear dying, we fear not having been alive, we fear that uh, we n will never amount to anything, that nothing we ever do and all our ideas will just run out in the sand. But we also fear dying, which is, you know, being, uh, we also fear being alive, which is like, what if I'm too alive? What if other people cut me down? What if other people see me as a threat? What if other people sabotage me? What if this doesn't work out? What if, you know, uh, I don't succeed? What if I grow too big or fly too close to the sun and I burn up? So that's the other grounding fear that we have. We have that fear that keeps us from uh, doing nothing and we have that fear that keeps us from doing too much. And uh, those things are the balance we have to do and the balancing act we have to constantly fall through on. So introverted feeling is that balancing act, that relief of, you know, healthy escapism. And I can tell you, it can be healthy or it can be unhealthy. It can be a sense of humor in times of adversity and challenge. It can be that ability to laugh at a situation or to find peace and calm and bliss in, you know, the failures and the mistakes and the things that go wrong. But it can also be that childish ability to avoid challenge and avoid difficulty and to never amount to anything. It can be that uh, uh, thing that keeps you from ever succeeding in anything. It can be that uh, fault to video games or to comics or to reading. Uh, as you know that you should be doing something more, as you know that there is something important that you should be doing right now. So. It can be that, you know, a healthy amount of hours we spend every day on play where we can just relax and just have fun and just let loose. But it can also be that thing that keeps us from challenge and makes us avoidant of taking risks and of trying new things. And often what you'll find is, you know, uh, the child functions, the tertiary functions, they're often uh, uh, associated with not just introverted feeling but also introverted sensing. Introverted sensing is also a key figure here, so it also plays a role here in this, the manner of escapism and what you hold on to. Like as an INTJ, you're constantly pulled between the past and what could be and what things really are. So you're pulled between that sage-like you know, question of what things really are and that uh, introverted sensing question of uh, what things have been. And then that extra intuitive question of what things could be, what things could become, you know. As an INTJ, I told you there's a tendency to be detached and distanced and to just have that, you know, sage-like wisdom of, you know, how the world works. You can become like a little bit like a Yoda figure, living alone on a secluded planet, never trying to change anything, never trying to do anything different. Just having your wisdom on your own island and never doing anything with it. But you also have extra intuition there as that inspirational pull, that unconscious inspirational pull that makes you go out and try to change the world. So often what you have to recognize is the auxiliary functions, they have to be supported by something. You need a support system to maintain the inspiration. Often what you find is the dominant function, that one's always on, that one's always going strong, it's flow. It's pretty easy to engage in and access, but inspiration, that takes energy to support so you have to feed into it and the only way you can feed into it is uh, on your own end it's vulnerability it's basically being able to put yourself out there and to try it out even if you don't know where it will lead and even if you don't know if you have the energy or the power or the resources to see it through and that hope hopefully as you do other people and the world around you will align with this wish and will help you out and will give you the support system you need to accomplish it. So what you need is, of course, that uh, other people will listen as you raise your voice for the first time and will go, wow. What you need is that other people will be curious when you start out on a new project and will be like, what is that project? And that will be the support system, you know, the friends and the people around you that provide backup, the mentors that have done it before you, that can tell you how it was and how the process felt like. And um, what you also need is the challenge of the people who will question you, you know, the people that will add as the challenge that you have to overcome. So... Those are the tools you need to understand the mind as INTJ. You need to understand these processes. <coughs> Sorry. You have to understand these processes and how they work in you. And you have to master these processes and you have to learn how to use them when healthy compared to when unhealthy. 
So hopefully this video has helped you understand a little bit more about yourself. And if it did, leave a like, share and subscribe. And if you have any questions about INTJs and about cognitive functions, feel free to add them in the comments down below or visit patreon.com slash to suggest your own videos or your own content or to share your own ideas. Thanks for watching and hope to see you guys in the next video.